started, the attendees will continue to roll in over time. Uh, I'm Marty Andres, a faculty at the uh, School of Sustainability and co-director of the Center for Behavior Institutions and the Environment. And today our Don't Waste the COVID-19 Crisis focuses on um, something that's very core to the crisis itself, that is the development of a vaccine. We've heard recently in the news about uh, large pharma pharmaceutical companies uh, making agreements about how they're going to focus on developing leasing vaccines. Uh, today we have a panel of three speakers, experts in the field. First is Tim Ford, who's a professor and chair of biomedical and nutritional sciences at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. We have uh, Jeannie Ward Robinson, who's PhD and CEO, Alliance for Global Health Innovation. And we have Charlie Swike, who's a professor of environmental conservation and public policy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. They're going to be discussing various <clears throat> at uh, various uh, issues regarding uh, the uh, development of vaccines. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, first Tim, who's going to discuss vaccines past, present, and future. Uh, and then he'll be followed by Charlie and Jeannie. And they, the panel themselves will let you know um, the progression of their topics. So with no nothing further from me, let me turn it over to Tim. Welcome. Thank you, Marty. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm and I appreciate um, being invited to join this webinar. As, uh, you know, my, my background is in water and health and the epidemiology of waterborne diseases. So vaccination has been important in, in treating preventable disease in my career. And you know, today, something that's important for me is the fact there's a, an effective oral cholera, cholera vaccine. So I will, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, you know, the, the past perspective um, where we are at the present, a little bit about the future, and some of the challenges that we really see in terms of global production and distribution. And Charlie will actually follow me by talking about uh, government investment in research and development and some of the contracting issues in the United States and uh, intellectual property and open sourcing of manufacturing processes. This builds on an article that um, he spearheaded, uh, has just come out um, in the conversation. So this uh, timing is, is good. And Jenny will, um, will finish by talking about equity and social justice issues, uh, primarily mm -hmm. focusing on low and middle income countries. Well, I think it's, it's, it's clear to most of us that vaccines are probably one of the, the most important breakthroughs in public health. If you imagine a world with smallpox and polio and some of the childhood diseases that I grew up with, well, it's a very different world today, at least it is in developed countries. You know, the World Health Organization's smallpox and polio eradication campaigns were not fixated on IP, intellectual property. You think about Jonas Salk, he essentially believed that the polio vaccine was a human right. It seems we are much more focused on global health solutions back then than we are today. Because the first generation, as they're called, attenuated or inactivated vaccines, uh, inactivated pathogens rather, were relatively simple compared to today's vaccine approach, where essentially we're, we're looking at protein synthesis within the, ho the host cell. We're trying to uh, convince the human host cell to produce a foreign protein that the immune system will then react to. And that protein in, the ter in relation to coronavirus is the, uh, it's the spike protein. So there are multiple layers of IP from developing the vaccine itself to the delivery mechanisms. How do you get this, uh, this messenger into the cell? Hence, hence the costs are high. I think it's worth, um, worth noting that vaccine production has not been a great money maker for the pharmaceutical companies. You know, some, some reports suggest it's two to 3% of the market. And this, you know, this is upsetting to me because as someone concerned with public health, it's far more profitable to treat disease than to prevent it. And of course I see, you know, in, in my own area of expertise, I see time and time again, high rates of morbidity and mortality in lower and middle income countries from preventable diseases. And, and this is partly a lack of health services, but also lack of delivery mechanisms for vaccines and for other 
medications. It's also a lack of incentives for big pharma to invest in products that are, are relatively low cost, or in fact, to develop um, you know, pricing strategies that would be appropriate for low and middle income countries. You then add to this the complacency we see particularly in high income countries about vaccines. And this has come about because we don't see much epidemic disease. And with this has come the surge in the antivirus movement, founded on un, or totally unfounded speculations, no scientific basis. But the result is that the market has been dropping and some pharmaceutical companies have even halted production of vaccines. So what has changed? Well, simply put, a global pandemic. Now, I'm, I'm in this discussion because most, as I said before, most infectious diseases are preventable. And this is something that I, I focus on within water and health in, in my career in public health. It's preventable through vaccines, but also through changes in human behavior. And of course, basic hygiene and sanitation. And none of this discussion is new. Now, I, I was actually privileged to be part of the New and Resurgent Disease Group at Harvard back in the early 1990s. This group was formed as a response to Ebola, HIV AIDS, and a, a plethora of other emerging diseases. Actually, Laurie Garrett, who some of you may have heard of, um, joined us for a year to research her book, The Coming Plague, which could not have more accurately predicted the current pandemic. Although, to be honest, I think we anticipated an even higher mortality risk. So why have we seemingly learned nothing in 30 years? Well, we're actually further ahead with COVID-19 due to early work on vaccine targets for two other coronaviruses, the uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or, or SARS, over 8,000 cases in 2002 and 2003 with almost 10% mortality. Then we had Med Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, almost 2,500 cases with, uh, in 2012 with 34% mortality. Now these are much higher mortality numbers than we see, than we've seen with, uh, with the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. Despite this early research on vaccine targets for SARS and MERS, we have no commercially available vaccine for either of these diseases. I want to quote um, Enrico Padron Regala from Oxford University. I actually think he's a doctoral student there. He, uh, he published an article in June 2020 in Infectious Disease Therapies uh, called um, Vaccines for SARS uh, CoV 2 Lessons from Other Coronavirus Strains. And I, I quote here It is probable that a vaccine has not been delivered because of the low interest in investing in a vaccine for a disease that has produced relatively low and geographically centralized cases compared with other more global and persistent infectious diseases such as influenza, HIV, and tuberculosis. Now, how do I read that? Well, I read that as saying we don't have these diseases, SARS or MERS, in the United States, so why should we care? So back to what has changed. Well, we now have a global pandemic that dramatically afflicts the US. And so there is significant money to be made in vaccines that can be distributed globally. And it's become an economic. And actually, I would add, and I doubt that our current government would see it this way, a humanitarian imperative. A report in the New York Times quoted data from the Global Trade Alert Project of the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. At least 69 countries have banned or restricted the export of protective equipment, medical devices, or medicines, and that includes the US. And I'd argue that nationalism and protectionism have defined this pandemic to date. The US even, we hear, uh, reached out to a promising German vaccine manufacturer to encourage them to move all their operation to the US. It's something the company denies, but Germany took it very seriously. The New York Times article also quotes the founder of the Global Trade Alert Project, Simon Evernet, as stating, the parties with the deepest pockets will secure these vaccines and medicines 
and essentially much of the developing world will be entirely out of the picture. Well, in the, the past, in the past, we've depended on the World Health Organization's leadership to address global disease, which makes the US's current attitude to the WHO deeply, deeply troubling. There are actually some shining lights out there. You know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation partnered with WHO, UNICEF, uh, the World Bank to create the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, known as Gavi. Gavi had been critical in providing access to vaccines for, for some of the poorest countries, but they are dependent on external funding. And this is becoming increasingly difficult while well, medicines or medications increase in cost and with the current political climate. So where, where is the model? Well, at the end of April, uh, WHO, Gates and others launched what they call the Access to COVID-19 Tools or ACT, A-C-T, Accelerator, described, and I quote here, as a groundbreaking global collaboration to accelerate development, production and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments and vaccines. The key to ACT is a partnership model that brings together, and again, I quote here, governments, scientists, businesses, civil society, and philanthropists, and global health organizations. The vaccine arm, as it's called of ACT, is the COVAX facility, which is to accelerate development and manufacture of vaccines and equitable access for all economies. So far, 156 economies that include 64 higher income countries have joined. To me, it's an absolute disgrace that the US is not among that number. Even the United Kingdom have joined, and that is saying something. So with greater buy-in, this model could address the cost. It could also provide a centralized resource on vaccine information, promising new formulations and regulatory parameters. However, distribution remains a huge challenge that I would argue can only begin to be addressed by promoting in-country manufacturing. I'm sure this is something that Jenny will talk more about. A 2016-17 article in Africa Renewal suggests that less than 2% of drugs consumed in Africa are actually produced on the continent. Many reasons for this they include IP, technology transfer, and even the argument that good manufacturing practices cannot be ensured in developing countries. Now, each of these arguments may have some merit, but the ultimate result is that people are dying unnecessarily. This will happen with COVID-19 unless we adopt the more progressive and more ethical approach articulated by Jonas Salk. You know, this approach is also adopted by the World Health Assembly in Resolution 55.16, urging member states to share expertise, supplies and resources to rapidly contain a public health emergency or mitigate its effects. The lack of capacity for in-country manufacturing is considered the most critical factor in vaccine supplies for low and middle income countries. Without in-country capacity, countries will always be at the mercy of the market forces within higher income countries. You know, there's actually, and to, to, to wind up here, there's an, actually a, been an excellent article in the American Journal for Public Health that was published in 2014 on improving global access to new vaccines outlined the challenges that are as relevant today as they were then, with the additional challenge of a political system in denial of a global pandemic. The author, who is UCLA's Sarah Eve Krager, addresses the issues of IP, technology transfer and regulatory pathways with the concept of an IPTK bank, which stands for intellectual property, technology and know-how. This bank provides the oversight and information flow to in-country manufacturers and is essentially the role that Gavi is playing. I think this represents some progress, but sadly we are a long way from a decade of vaccines collaborations vision to extend the full benefits of immunization to all people, regardless of where they are born, who they are or where they live by 2020. I'd like to uh, turn the conversation over to Charlie Schweik. Charlie. 
Thanks, Tim. Um, that was a nice setup for what I want to talk about. Um, which relates to uh, the COVID-19 vaccine contracting policy. And what I'm going to give is a bit of a, a history uh, of what's been happening in the United States. And uh, I'm also a knowledge commons person with the IASC. And so what I'm going to be trying to emphasize through this is uh, a knowledge commons open sourcing approach um, toward the manufacturing and distribution of vaccines. So let me start with um, things we probably all know about um, and, and Tim touched on in some of his talk, but uh, we, we know there's a multi-million, multi-billion dollar race going on um, toward a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, back in uh, May 2020, which led me to start thinking about this, there was a New York Times article that quoted John Deemers who is, the assistant, who is the Assistant Secretary General for the U.S. National Security, saying that, uh, it, quote, biomedical research has been a long focus of theft, especially by the Chinese government, and vaccines and treatments for the coronavirus are today's holy grail. Putting aside the commercial value, there would be great geopolitical significance to being the first to develop a treatment or vaccine. We will use all the tools we have available to safeguard American research. Um, also around May, there was another story in the New York Times that reported um, that the potential financial award for a company that markets a successful vac vaccine could be in the billions of dollars. More recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, in the New York Times had a front page story that many of you probably saw that said, had a title, something like the race for coronavirus vaccine pits spy against spy and talked about a contest uh, kind of reminiscent of the space race that's now between US, Russia and China over the vaccine development. Um, now, one of the points that's been made, which I think is a valid point, is that there's also, once some country actually develops a vaccine, some firm or organization, there's going to be great political pressure, most likely, to vaccinate in-country first as the production rolls up. Um, there'll be limited amounts of supply. And so there's, there's that uh, legitimate political pressure that might be put on whatever country comes up to this. And in one of the, other, one of the articles in the New York Times, a, a vaccine scientist said, the only solution is to make a hell of a lot of vaccine in a lot of different places. And so this, this gets at the points that Tim was just saying about manufacturing. And I know Jenny in the third part of the talk will be talking about this as well. Um, so in my remarks now, I'm gonna focus more about vaccine manufacturing and distribution rather than the research and development, since most of the contracts for the vaccine research are well underway. But it's useful to look at the, the way the COVID vaccine R&D contracting policy in the United States, um, looking at that history, um, because it, 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 gives us, uh, it, it gives us some questions to ask about public policy and investment. So let me, get, let me take a couple minutes to describe this. So in the US, um, related to vaccine research and development and the contracting policy around it, uh, we all know, or um, I'm sure, that early stage vaccine R&D often relies on substan substantial public sector investment. And the last, when, when I was looking at this a couple weeks ago, the number was about 26 vaccines worldwide were undergoing human trials um, for COVID-19. Uh, eventually, if the results demonstrate safety and effectiveness, um, in the U.S., the regulators will approve a vaccine license that will allow the organization that invented it to begin to manufacture and distribute it. Now, in the United States, there are a number of firms with active COVID-19 vaccine R&D contracts that have been financed with large sums of U.S. taxpayer money. One example is Moderna, uh, uh, which is currently in phase three trials and uh, received a contract valued at approximately 955 million US dollars to do that R&D. Now, what some of you may not know if you're based in the United States or elsewhere, 
is that U.S. federal contracting falls under the jurisdiction of a law that was passed in 1980 called the Bayh-Dole Act. And within that law, uh, the law grants first an exclusive license over the product patent to the, to the, dis the discovering organization. But it also provides some safeguards to the U.S. Um, taxpayers of what are called margin rights. And these margin rights allow the federal government to withdraw the exclusive license if the patent invention is not made to the public under, quote, reasonable terms. What that means in part is if we've invested a lot of money into a vaccine, R&D, and then the firm sells it at a price uh, policymakers feel is un unreasonable, um, they can take over the patent, essentially. Another firm can be asked to take it over. That's what March in laws, in March in clause uh, provides. Um, but interestingly, there's an alternative contracting vehicle that's called other transaction agreements or OTAs that allow federal agencies to enter into legally binding contracts, R&D contracts, but outside of the Bayh-Dole Act's provisions. And there are several firms, R&D firms, that have been contracted to do R&D around COVID-19 vaccines that fall under OTAs, and those margin clauses do not um, come into play. So um, if, we, if, if we need to get a hell of a lot of vaccine out in a lot of different places, my suggestion is from a public policy standpoint is to openly share or open source these licenses in the manufacturing to distribution rather than providing contracts to firms that do not provide that open sharing. Now, what I want to explain now as I, as I move toward wrapping up is um, there's a really interesting case that I discovered when I was studying open source software um, in the United States, and I don't think many people know about this case, but it dates back to the 1830s um, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution where the U.S. Army, and specifically the Springfield, Massachusetts Armory, which is just down the R Connecticut River from where I am in, in University of Massachusetts, Amherst, well, uh, the, the, the Springfield Armory, Armory wanted to develop manufacturing processes and capabilities around the standardized parts for small weapons. Now, in those early contracts with manufacturing firms, the, the Army and the, U, and the Springfield Armory gave them open access, gave the contractor firms back in the 1830s, 40s, um, they gave them open access to the designs of the newly invented manufacturing equipment but with an explicit requirement in their contracts. And the contracts essentially said, if the contractors improved the machines or the processes in making these small arm parts around the machines, they had to, to keep their contract, they had to share those innovations with the armory, with the armor, army, and with their competitors. So we didn't have the term open source back then, but essentially what this armory contracting policy was, was requiring their contractors in order to get the funding to open source any innovations they make. I would call it new derivative work if they've improved the process somehow to share it. And according to the study's author, Bruce Tall, the U.S. arms um, manufacturing capabilities advanced over the next 30 years far greater than what happened in Britain, for example, um, arguably because of this openness policy. So to close, um, if, if our, the discovery of a safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine is arguably, as Tim suggested, a global public good, the idea that we have a space race to invent and nationalistic policies emphasizing the protection of IP rather than emphasizing the sharing should be seriously questioned. And if we wanna get a hell of a lot of vaccine manufactured and distributed around the world as quickly as possible, contracting policies both in the US and other uh, countries that are investing should be following an open access sharing and new derivative type policy 
demonstrated by the Springfield Armory in the 1800s. Now, Tim mentioned that uh, organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, there's an International Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Initiatives. They're already doing this type of thing or, or pushing um, in this direction, which is great. But the longer to term goal is that we need to be building sustainable vaccine manufacturing and delivery systems within low and middle income countries and, and open, opening these up in, in a form of knowledge commons. So with that, I'm now gonna turn it to Jenny, who's going to speak about um, the um, inequities that may be going on on the ground and in more detail, some of the elements of what these manufacturing and distribution processes would be in, in these countries. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yes, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, over the past 20 years, I have worked across several continents within low and middle income countries focused on the challenges of global health policy and the application of these outcomes to improving the quality of life for these communities. Yet COVID-19 has brought these challenges to the global perspective into the homes of every single human being. And it challenges us to think about not only access and distribution, but it, it challenges us to think about how do we do this in a manner that's equitable, that's affordable, and that's available to global communities, particularly those in low to middle income countries, if we truly want to arrest the pandemic. Uh, Tim talked about the challenges of manufacturing, IP, IP ownership, and investment, uh, the need for investment by some global leaders, which we have seen it ident uh, exemplified already through the COVAX platform. And, and I'll speak about that in a minute, but Charlie focused on uh, the policies of vaccine distribution through the Commons lens and, and talked about the need to really reflect on lessons we've learned and how those lessons from the past might be appropriate in ensuring equitable access to these vaccines. But at the end of the day, I asked myself, what does this mean for low income countries? Because while these issues are relevant and pertinent, my thoughts go to the ground, to the day-to-day -day lives of those in these low to middle income countries, and to realize that these issues are not new whether it was Zika in, the, in Latin America, Caribbean, uh, dengue still exists, chikungunya, so many things. And as Tim said, they're not in the developed countries and so maybe they go unnoticed. But I want to challenge you to think about how do we begin to consider progressive approaches as Tim mentioned, but take a systemic response, a response that allow us to move beyond the humanitarian lens and to uh, not have us address the challenges that COVID is, in covering, is uncovering at the moment. And that means that we need to think about sustainable solutions that target um, distribution, access, and manufacturing. But to do that, we have to make sure that we do not render uh, these, uh, an additional burden on the countries that cannot be borne as in the same with high income countries. We have to consider that the SDGs are our guiding North Star. And in, in that way, it suggests that we should all be committed to improving the quality of lives for individuals, irrespective of geography, irrespective of, of the society. And if that is true, and we are committed to that uh, platform, then manufacturing, producing and distributing vaccines to ensure equitable access will require global cooperation in ways that are not generally considered in the developed settings. However, if ignored, our capacity to be in solidarity with others will be tested again beyond our economy and beyond our capacity to respond through a humanitarian lens. So what do I mean by that? It means that we have to consider the following factors. When we think about infrastructure, what about supply chain? 
What about cold storage? What about education? What about the infrastructure associated with delivery? And if and when a therapy is deemed appropriate, approved and essential, how do we then uh, ensure that it is delivered in a way to really reduce transmission and protect against infection? Another factor that requires our consideration is timing. What is the timeline between approval and delivery to low to middle income countries? Should early conversation begin now with these countries so that we can be thoughtful and be planning in our delivery strategy? Because if not, what good then does approval of the vaccine serve to low and middle income countries? Uh, currently, we, we know about the COVAX and we know that that platform has been ceded by the, U the UK government. We know that uh, Gavi has been in place. Should we raise the level of the competencies of these organizations to ensure that when the approval is gained, we can leverage the strategic skills of these organizations in order to ensure timely delivery then of the vaccine to low and middle income countries. Other than that, how do we address this gap? And when I think about delivery, delivery is more than, than the actual delivery of the vaccine. It has to do with um, the requirements of electricity and cold storage. Is the power grid capable of supporting this? Do we think about the ability to um, uh, render safety of the vaccine and its integrity in a low to middle income country where the uh, power grid is often at risk and may fail, where data communication is risky and sporadic? Uh, what lessons have we learned that we can implement in order to decrease further burden on these countries if in fact we are to effectively deliver this vaccine once it is approved. What about affordability? COVAX has, COVAX argues for uh, accessibility by all through this shared investment, but of the, uh, 73 of the world's poorest countries, will they be able to participate even at the level that is afforded Gavi? It has been my experience that oftentimes it may not occur as we hypothesize from our developed chairs. What about compliance? How do we measure compliance if in fact we're able to deliver this vaccine? Who provides the education? In the US, there is a resistance to vaccine. And I will tell you from personal experience, oftentimes communities in emerging economies will often say, if it is not good enough for the US, why should we take it? How do we address that gap? How do we bridge that knowledge? Recognizing that skilled labor and capacity may, may be a luxury in low to middle income countries. This will threaten not only sus sustaining the virus, but it limits the ability to really arrest and bring this into uh, some, some form of closure or uh, an acceptable level of tolerance. And ultimately, how do we access data then about the factors that I've mentioned beforehand so that we can track and follow up as needed? Uh, I had the opportunity to participate in a call from the Africa Development Bank, and a massive concern they have is data tracking, data collection. How do you not only diagnose, how do you then follow up, and then how do you aggregate the data, and then what do you do with the data? Uh, certain countries can, certain countries cannot. This, all of these are factors at the ground that will limit the successful deployment of a vaccine solution. What about corruption? We know within low to middle income countries, 
we know that those most vulnerable may not often gain access. And, and because of a myriad of factors, that vulnerability remains. And ultimately, is their political will. We can have grand plans, we can have grand ideas, we can consider through our humanitarian lens, quoted in other ways, but is there political support in the low to middle income countries and political will in order to arrest COVID-19 and prevent future pandemics? So we have to argue for new models of engagement that build capacity and strengthen the health systems in these countries. Thankfully, we do have COVAX. Thankfully, we have the commitment of global leaders and some private public partnerships. And thankfully, we have information and the opportunity to talk about how we may close some of these gaps. Yet, these are not new questions. These are not new concerns. COVID has just made it clear to us. And we must consider the fundamental challenges that limit the success of strong health systems in low to middle income countries that allow better prediction of disease threats. We must understand the economic constraints that limit their ability to not only receive, deliver, and manage healthcare appropriately, but we must consider these in the context of COVID, knowing that COVID-20 is around the corner. Thank you, and I'll now take your questions. Wow, fantastic uh, discussion. First, let me thank Charlie, Tim, and Jenny for their interesting <clears throat> perspectives on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine process. So uh, during this discussion phase, let me ask the participants to please post their questions to the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen next to chat, between chat and participants, there's the Q&A icon. So uh, like with any, any system that's focused on delivering material and information somewhere, there are all these interesting aspects regarding different types of infrastructures in the system. And uh, the, the way we, we govern information and distribution is really an interesting question, especially in a case like vaccines where equity issues seem to, to really be prominent. But uh, before we take specific questions from the participants, I'd like to ask each of you to give your perspectives um, uh, on uh, when, when if you could give us a little scenario on what you think may happen once a vaccine is available. Suppose, for example, that one of the big pharma companies in, uh, comes up with a vaccine. What's going to happen next? I don't know which of you wants to take that first, but it's, it's kind of an interesting exercise in scenarios. I'll, I'll start. Jenny, um, yeah. <laughs> I'll start because um, this is a, a, you know, when Zika arrived in the U.S., uh, there was, there was, the attention was turned to look at the U.S. response in order to, to determine what would happen, even though in Brazil there was a massive effort underway to try to arrest and, well, first to discover um, the, the, the exposure and its root and then treatment because it presented in, in so many variant ways. And I think that the same thing is going to happen. Um, Two things that I think are, 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 are being considered, what, what next? So after the vaccine is discovered and approved, what does that mean for, I, I listened to the Prime Minister of Barbados spoke on, uh, speaking on the call last week and she said, for her, the vaccine means uh, a return to economic growth because the vaccine means that Americans will be able to travel to the sand and the sea, and therefore the government will be able to resume its revenue and not risk financial um, tragedy because of the absence of tourism, knowing that tourism is essential to the country's livelihood. So if you think about that, one would think, oh, we need to have the vaccine in Barbados for our citizens but the primary focus is on the survival of the country. 
So there needs to be that early conversation now with these countries to begin to think about what happens when it becomes available, as well as the context of the country's economic survival. The luxury is not afforded of uh, disaggregated conversations. They're all intertwined. And, and that is oftentimes the challenge of low to middle income countries. Interesting. So the kind of spatial variation in availability will be critical economically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Barbados is not unique. This was a meeting that was held with the uh, countries in the, Car the CARICOM community, the Caribbean area community, the Caribbean area community. And so this is the, the, the threat of COVID. Not only, you know, Trinidad has about 60 deaths now since it started, but they're locked down because they're closing the door to Americans because we don't have the vaccine. So it is not about the vaccine utilization in the region as much as it is the return of the US dollar through tourism to improve the economic well-being. Then perhaps we can think about access to the vaccine for our residents. Interesting. Charlie has to uh, go teach, I know. Do you want to comment before you have to zoom off to class? Well, I was, I was going to say I, I, I appreciate Jenny's points, um, a couple of them. I was uh, having some more thoughts. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we all know is with this space race, I think we're seeing uh, different countries uh, suggest a launching it, 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 with uh, different levels of vetting and testing and safety and going through the trial system. So I think it's an open question, you know, depending on who gets to the point where it gets under their uh, uh, oversight regime, you know, to what degree is it actually safe um, uh, to be launched. But then the other thing that I've been thinking about recently is, uh, and, and Tim and Jenny probably know more about this than I do, um, you know, there are different technologies for these vaccines. One, the RNA vaccines, I understand, um, are two vaccine uh, distribution systems. You have to get two. Um, and I think they also have to be frozen yes. and transported frozen and maintained frozen to be safe. Yeah. Whereas, whereas some of these other vaccines are one vaccine that don't, don't have to be frozen. So depending on which one gets launched, what type it is, and some of the infrastructure needed to, to transmit those. Um, yeah, so I, th those, are, those are two, two thoughts around um, kind of the dynamics of the situation. But I think the last thing I'll say here is that the, uh, um, as I think Jenny said, you know, the, when, when something safe and effective gets launched, um, there's going to be tremendous pressure, at least in the short term, to protect the people in their country that want it. And those people may not be necessarily the ones that need it the most, uh, the elderly, for example, or, or uh, people on the front lines, for example. So, uh, yeah, so there'll be some interesting dynamics going on. I don't know, Tim, if you want to follow up with anything? I can, if I can find the unmute button, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would, I would just build on what you were saying there, Charlie, that uh, that's sort of my concern as well, the different technologies, the two, the U.S. and the U.S.-Germany uh, affiliate collaboration, uh, Moderna and Pfizer, and I, I blank on the name of the German company, are focusing on the messenger RNA vaccines, which have, you know, complex delivery mechanisms to the cells and which are going to be relatively high price. And a lot of people are going to demand that piece of the IP. So I'm not sure that I see those vaccines as being the ones that will be globally distributed. I think there's much greater chance that the one being de uh, developed in China, uh, even the one being developed in Russia, other parts of the world are more likely to be distributed. And in some ways we may have greater assurance of the safety of those vaccines because of the untested nature of the messenger RNA-based vaccination. I, I actually think the pricing strategy means that what's going to be produced within America will, will stay within America, at least in the near term. Interesting. That brings up kind of a, 
question, uh, uh, devil's advocate kind of question uh, about individuals, taxpayers in a particular country uh, who, who, based on the fact that they have contributed their tax dollars to the development of the vaccine, feel that they have a social justice or equity argument in demanding first access. Does that, mm. does that question make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it, it it does, and um, and and you know, I struggle with that, and and the idea of this broader commitment to humanity, the broader commitment that I think is intrinsic to the the fundamental premise of the commons. It it, it is how do we you know. When Zika came, I used to, when I would come back to the U.S., I would always say in my comments, um, Zika does not require a passport. It does not require, you know, it, it moves. And so we cannot, we cannot simply look inward. And, and, and the lower to middle income countries may not have skin in the game vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis investment, but we require the safety and protection of all citizens so that the world is healthy. And, and I feel as though it cannot be only through a humanitarian lens that is hopscotched or ad hoc. We have to figure out how do we lift up societies at large, irrespective of the investment, irrespective of who paid the entry fee because we all pay at the end. In the end game, we all pay. And, and we're, we're experiencing that now. So I feel that whether you invested or not, we have to move beyond that thinking. But Tim, uh, you, you expressed the concern that in fact, the kinds of, and Charlie as well, the kinds of technology used would then regionally restrict which vaccines are going where. where. For example, another question came up regarding uh, taking the distribution system into account. I think it's a great question uh, or issue that Jenny brought up. Is that it's not just the vaccine. You have this entire infrastructure system that you need to get it to where it needs to get into the people right. who need it. Right. So the technology you choose to develop, the kind of vaccine technology will then dictate the other infrastructure that's necessary to deliver it so that different directions uh, in the vaccine research will definitely determine the spatial distribution of the vaccine itself. So this sort of RNA based one uh, won't, likely, won't likely play as big a role as other approaches uh, would in dealing with uh, middle income countries. Yeah, I, I think um, you know, that's, that's absolutely right. And I, I think as I mentioned the um, we call it the, the IPTK bank approach, which is essentially Garvey, is a is a, a way or the beginnings of centralizing that activity of information right. on vaccines, the most recent um, discoveries in vaccination, the regulatory pathways that are required, safety issues, etc., and to oversee the distribution and manufacturing within countries. I mean, this is again part of the problem that manufacturers have not been supported. In their development within countries. And it doesn't speak to the broader issue that Jenny's talking about, bringing all countries up to a higher level. But I think it's, it's, it's the beginning of a model. I think what we fail to do, perhaps, in, in these discussions is, re is recognize that the U.S. is not the leader here. And the U.S. is probably not going to be the leader for some time to come. We've got to look to other countries, hopefully in partnership with the World Health Organization, um, but even that is not necessarily going to be the case. I know that China is going to have an influence on parts of the world that the World Health Organization will not. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that from my perspective if they are helping bring people up to a whole new level and helping provide them with the health services they need, including vaccinations. I think it, I, it's... I want to... Uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead Jane. Well, I wanted to add to what you say to say that the only thing I would add to that is that we must also begin to include the low to middle income countries leadership in the conversations and allow for consideration of the challenges 
and, and how they might consider their capacity to respond in preparation and in the face of. And, and, and we must move from this almost a patriarchal model that considers designing for the world and then distributing to the world. Uh, you know, I think we, if we did that, we would not run up against this wall consistently. We would be aware of the fact that, you know, it is, it is now hurricane season, well, we're coming to the end of it, but that, you know, the electricity is sporadic or, or the ability to cold storage and supply chain is limited, but yet vaccines are given. How is it done? What can we learn from these low to middle income countries? We need to bring them into the conversation early on. That's the only thing I would add to what you're saying. And I agree with you, Jenny, and maybe the focus, the major focus on vaccines that require cold storage is inappropriate for some of these countries. Yes. They're, they're dried oral rehydration. Yes. Uh, vaccines that are, have potential that are not being investigated, as far as I know, at this point in relation to COVID. There are right. other technologies out there. Yes. Um, super interesting subtleties here. Uh, one of the uh, participants raised a kind of a complex question about the interaction of self-interest and um, collective interest. In the same way the fisher removes too many fish uh, and leaves none for the future, then in, in, you know, helps themselves now, but hurts themselves in the future. The typical common pool resource dilemma here. Uh, the question is, <clears throat> in what sense can we make arguments to administrations, say, for example, in the United States, that uh, it really is a question of self-interest to, in fact, develop technology that can be used to treat the world as a, as a, as a commons, because we don't want to reinfect the United States. I'm sure that the, the global uh, air carriers uh, in the United States are keen to start, you know, flying again to foreign locations and then uh, uh, enabling vacation travel. But we can't treat only America and, and, then, and then spend, I don't know, money and resources to try to manage the flow of people back and forth. So I guess the question is, uh, uh, you know, do you guys see any any mechanisms towards helping nations see their self-interest? I mean, getting getting uh, the whole world community to the table is critical in the conversation. But but uh, the question is, uh, maybe we just need a, uh, a a leader, right? Maybe maybe it is the competition between you know global powers right now wanting to assume global leadership in this space who will maybe take the first move and, and do the moral thing rather than the, or the long-term rather than the short-term thing. I would, any hope I would for that? Agree that? Absolutely. I don't think you'll have any disagreement from me and Jenny on that. I mean, there's a vacuum right. in leadership in this yeah. country with the right leadership. We will go in the right direction. We will go back to those days where polio eradication and smallpox eradication were, were central to our strategies yeah. for dealing with global health. We're so I far think, go ahead, Tim, sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Jane. Well, what I wanted to say, you know, you're right, Tim, and, and I think that the challenge for us in the global health field um, is that we've, we have really not been successful our, at articulating the economic value of global health. And if we can better articulate the burden beyond frequency of the disease or the economic burden of care delivery or, you know, if we can really begin to understand the risk to economies, whether the economies are at the family level, the community, the state, the country level, then, then we can have better conversations, I think. I, I think that we are limited and we, we run against this challenge. You know, it's a wall we hit our heads into every time something comes around without stopping to consider what are the broader implications of making a solution available 
and what are the risk of not making the solution available across all of its, its tentacles. And one that is important is economics. We have to go across that divide. And I think if we did that, we would understand that it is in our self-interest to ensure that the world is healthy. It, you know, it is in our self-interest to make sure that healthcare is available, infrastructure, that we have data about the rest of the world and the quality of life and the risk. And, and we can better predict the emergence of threats. Yeah, I think, I think uh, that's the yeah. I think that's a that's a super super uh, clear articulation of the nature of uh, global health as a global commons, a global public good. Yes. And if we provide that public good well, then there'll be all sorts of positive spillovers that I would think most epidemiologists that I I interact with or, or public health officials really do focus a lot on the individual, providing yes. services to individuals, yes. which is great, but they're not considering the spillovers of healthy individuals globally. So maybe yes. that would be a really important conversation to have. And, and when you move into low to middle income countries, we must remember that the Minister of Health often has the weakest gavel in the budget decision. And, and, and lacking this kind of information the country will often have a burden that affects their GDP. And so when initials, when these challenges arise, it becomes a burden, an additional burden where a trade-off is not a win-win, it's a win-lose, which affects all of us. Well, we have a couple of more questions. Just, uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, a, a colleague of ours has just asked a very good question that I don't think we're going to have a Good, a good answer for, um, and that's how do companies ensure that clinical trials are appropriately diverse, accounting for the ethnic and cultural differences of our populations in low resource communities, you know, both within the US and within the developing world. And I'm afraid that's a question that needs to go to those companies to, uh, because I, my suspicion is, and I suspect your question comes from from this place that you don't believe they are looking at the right populations and I suspect you're absolutely right although it's obviously a very important question I don't know Jenny if you have any answers for uh, Dr. Roya uh, I don't know if I have an answer but I'll be um, I will be uh, probably challenged with respect to this position but I think it is the way that funding occurs and and that scholars are not driven and motivated sufficiently to include minorities and, and, and diverse populations in clinical trials. You know, oftentimes you see funding is received and there's an explanation as why we could not access. It was a difficult to reach population. Um, but you know, that said, Jenny, the, um, if, if funding comes from the NIH, then there are some very strict human subjects guidelines on ensuring diversity in your population. Whether, mm -hmm. the, whether it's still the right population is, is another question it's, altogether. And, and, and also, I think that if companies are going to bring a product to the market, broad market, they too should be held accountable to consider the design and the inclusion a priori to ensure that efficacy is there and a clear understanding, I think that will go a long way to building trust. It will go a long way to even protecting their brand. And I think it will save the end result of resistance and uncertainty if this was addressed up front. Okay, fantastic discussion. I'd like to thank our speakers. Charlie's already gone. Thanks to Charlie, thanks to Tim and Jenny. Uh, it's, it's past the hour now. We have a couple more questions, but I think uh, we'll have to shut it down for now. Thanks again, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you at the next COVID uh, webinar. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.